The Bitter Side of Sweet, Chapter 15 I leaped to my feet and grabbed my machete, hauling Sadu into my arms, embracing against the wall of sacks behind us. He flails around, which makes him hard to hold, and I realize that I don't have very good odds of making it past the big man, especially carrying a fighting eight-year-old. I stutter to a stop. Khadija's on her feet, too, clutching the med kit and her empty water bottle to her chest, her whole body pressed into the sacks of cacao, as if she's trying to vanish into them. I see a small crowd forming behind the pastor, and my hope of getting away trickles out of me. It's like losing blood. It makes me feel weak and shaky. I sink to the bed of the truck with Sato in my lap and hang my head. Khadija moves to stand behind me. What are your names? asks the pastor. He's speaking Bambara, and his accent makes me think he might be from Mali originally like us, but I'm not about to tell him anything. Tie us up and take us back. I don't even care anymore, I think. Now that I know we're caught, I just want it to be over already. Hoping hurts too much. Do you not speak Bambara? He asks, confused by our silence. Of course we do, but still none of us answers him. The pastor doesn't move, but leans against the tailgate, looking at us. I glance warily at the muscles cording his thick arms and the stretch of his shirt across his wide chest. He's every bit as big a brute as I thought he was when I first saw him in the clearing of the farm. But when I lift my head and look at his face, I'm surprised to see that it's broad and open and that his eyes are gentle. He looks like he could have come from my village. Those eyes take me in at a glance and then spend a long moment on Khadija's bruised face and Sadu's missing arm. His smile, when it comes, is forced. Well, I'm Omar, he says, and it looks to me like maybe you three could use some food. Come on. He unhooks the tailgate with one strong tug of his burly arms and it flaps down with a clunk. None of us move. I sit numbly, clutching Sadu and my machete. Khadija makes a small noise behind me. I wish I could do something to comfort her, but I don't see any way to get out of this. The man's big hand closes on my elbow, and as my options narrow to move or be dragged, I scoot forward and climb carefully out of the truck, holding Sadu tight against me. He's gone still in my arms, and his eyes are round as coins. The pastor puts his other big hand on Sadu's shoulder and steers us away from the truck. Oddly, he doesn't try to take my machete. I shrug off his touch and turn back. I tuck the blade into my belt and hold out my hand to Khadija. Come on, I say softly. Let's stay together. Shaky with fear, Khadija slides to the end of the tailgate and grabs my hand in a death grip. Then she jumps out, and with Sadu in one hand and her in the other, I follow the pastor, walking stiffly to one of the little houses that line the road. The villagers move out of our way, whispering to each other. Feeling like each arm and leg weighs a hundred kilograms, I head into the small, dark front room. The shadow of the big man cuts off any hope of escape. Entering the little house after us, the pastor is so tall he has to duck to avoid hitting his head on the rotting crossbeam. The floor is bare, and there's one table in the center of the room with mismatched chairs and stools around it. Khadija, Sadu, and I turn and look at the pastor. Sit, sit, he says, waving at the table. Khadija sits on a low stool and pulls Sato against her. It's a testament to how scared he is that he lets her. I refuse to sit. Instead, I stand behind them and cross my arms over my chest, staring at the pastor. The big man sighs as he sits across the room. His gaze wanders from one to the other of us, resting on Sadu the longest. Finally, he leans forward. I'm going to ask you a few questions, he says quietly, and I want you to tell me the truth. I don't need to know your names, but I do need to know this. We don't say anything. The big man goes on. Were you working on the farm I collected cacao from today? He pauses, looking at us. When none of us answer, he adds, the one that had a fire? I'm pretty sure there's only one farm that caught on fire today. Out of the corner of my eye, I see say do not, yes. I scowl. It can't possibly help us to have this giant know that we were on that farm. But two years of answering automatically when a big man asks you something or suffering the consequences have sunk in. Are you family members of one of the men there? The pastor asks. Sadu shakes his head no. 
Did you get paid while you work there? I can't help it. An unpleasant laugh sneaks out of me. Khadija and Sadu both shake their heads. The pastor's eyes drip to Sadu's missing arm. Last question, he says. Would you like to go back to the farm and continue working there? No, the word bursts out of my mouth. No, agree Khadija and Sadu right after me. The man purses his lips and looks at his big hands, spreading them on the table between us. I'm only going to say this once, he says carefully after a pause, and I don't want you to tell me any more about yourselves than you already have, because I need to keep a good relationship with the farmers I work with. His eyes flick to our faces. But I don't agree with children being made to work without pay for family for people who aren't family. I feel an odd squishiness in my chest and realize that it might be hope bubbling back. I'm driving east with my wares to Daola, where I will sell the cacao seeds. The man looks me straight in the eye. I am not offering you a ride, he says, but I am telling you that I will not be checking my truck when I leave in the morning, and I will probably stop somewhere quiet to look at the scenery. Do you understand? Numbly, I nod. Khadija still looks stunned, but taking her cue from me, nods too. Sedu looks confused. The big man smiles. He winks at Sedu and pushes away from the table. I'll have my niece bring you some dinner. You can sleep in this room for the night, but I suggest you wake up early. I leave just after dawn. His smile widens to a grin. Me and my empty truck. With that, he walks out of the room. Sedu twists around to face me. He's going to help us? Hope and fear struggle to claim his features. I don't believe it, I say honestly. I sink onto the stool next to Khadija and Sedu, not sure whether my knees are still capable of holding me up. A woman comes out from a side room and puts some food in front of us. Hard-boiled eggs and fruit, bowls of spicy kejenu and fluffy white atieki to go with it. It's the best meal I've seen in years. My stomach rumbles loudly, and despite my uncertainty about Omar, I thank her sincerely, along with Khadija and Sedu. Khadija sets the hard-boiled eggs and the fruit aside for tomorrow, tying them into a strip of burlap she must have ripped from a sack in the truck. By the time she's finished, the panic in her eyes has pulled back like the tide. I put a bowl in front of Sedu, hand another to Khadija, and eat the portion that's left. Sedu picks at the food with his right hand, not really eating it. I reach past Khadija and rattle the little box. Should we give more medicine to Sedu? She considers. Yes, she says finally. It's probably been four to six hours. I suppose we could. She opens the box and squints at the faded labels again. You gave him that one first last time, I say, pointing to one of them. She takes the one I'm pointing to and looks at it carefully. Then she looks at me in surprise. You're right. How did you read it from there? Read it? I ask, staring at her. It's the bottle with the chip off the bottom, and its plastic is slightly darker than the other one, I laugh. I can't read. What on earth is that crazy girl thinking? Farm kids don't have the time or money to go to school. Even in the days before Sedu and I were forced to work for Musa, we couldn't afford that. We worked all day in the fields then, too, but we were with family and growing things for us to eat not stupid cacao. We barely made enough to feed our family, certainly not enough to pay for school uniforms and supplies. I shake my head. Khadija looks away and shakes a pill out of each of the two vials. She doesn't say anything, but it's pretty clear she had been reading them. I wonder again at how much better off Khadija was than we were. How much money must her family have to be able to spend it on all the supplies it would take to send her to school for enough years that she can read so easily. I have trouble even imagining. I'm surprised to realize that even though I've started to think of her as a little sister, I don't really know much about Khadija at all. Sedu swallows the medicine and leans against her, and Khadija looks over his head at me. Here. Let me take him, I whisper, because even though he's only picked at his meal, Sedu's eyelids are drooping. I haul my drowsy brother to the edge of the room and lay him under a window, so we'll have the best odds of getting away if he needs to escape in a hurry. I'm exhausted and the sound of Sedu's even breathing filling the space makes me want nothing more than to
to drift off to sleep beside him. But there's something we have to decide before we allow ourselves the luxury of sleep. It's great that the pastor isn't turning us in, I say softly to Khadijah, but I still don't think we should go with him. Why not? She asks. Two reasons, I say, walking back over to the table. First, yes, he's being nice to us now, but we don't have any guarantee that he won't change his mind. He could get to Daula and decide that he'd rather turn us in after all or sell us to someone else. You heard what he said about wanting to keep a good relationship with the farmers. I don't know, murmurs Khadija. If he'd wanted to turn us in, he could have easily done that here. We've no reason not to trust him after he's taken this chance to help us. He doesn't like seeing children made to work, but it sounds like she's trying to convince herself. I raise my eyebrows. Of course it's possible that he's telling the truth. It's also possible that he's not. We've both been lied to enough to know that either outcome is just as likely. After a moment, she looks down at the table again. What's your other reason? The other reason is even simpler, I say tiredly. It's nice that he's offering to take us with him, but he's going the wrong direction. We don't want to go southeast. We need to go north. So, I continue, I think we should all get a couple of hours of sleep, and then when it's close to dawn, we can sneak out into the forest. We know the road we came in on, and we can follow that a lot of the way. Maybe we wait in the bush for a few days. Make sure the bosses have given up looking for us, then make our way around the farms to the border. Once we get past the farm we were on, it might be harder, but we can keep pretty good track of our direction from the sun. My trip to the farm from Sikasso was less than a day using motorbikes and cars, so on foot, we should be there in less than a week, even going through La Brosse. About that. Khadija says, her fingernail tracing and retracing the grain of the wood in front of her. There's something I've been meaning to talk to you about. I look at her. Yes? I'm not from Mali, like you, she starts unsteadily. I'm actually Ivorian. I live with my mama in Abidjan. Her dark eyes, wide in her oval face, dart to mine to see how I take this. I can't help but stare. I had figured out she was fancy, but I had always assumed she, like pretty much every kid on the farm, came from Mali. Her name is Muslim, like ours. She speaks Bambara, like us. I'd never imagined she was Ivorian, like the bosses. I feel betrayed. I lean away from her. Ivorian? Rich? City-living Ivorian? My feelings must show on my face because when she goes on, she won't meet my eyes. So, you see, Daola is actually going in the right direction for me. And if it's a town big enough for Omar to sell his seeds, then that probably means it's on a main road, which might make it easy for me to find my way home. And I, I was hoping you'd come with me. It takes me a minute to remember that Omar is the pastor's name. I blink dumbly, not quite believing we're having this conversation. Amadou? She says, finally looking at me. There are tears piling on her lower lashes, but I don't want to see them. Yes, I say. No, you can't ask me to go farther into this country full of bosses and cacao. You can't make me stay here longer. I need to get home. I need to get Seydou home. I wrench the med kit off the table and grip it hard. You can get up tomorrow morning and sneak into Omar's truck and ride all the way south to the ocean if you want to. But Sadu and I are taking the medicine and we're going home. Just because you're rich and, and Ivorian, I don't have to do what you tell me to do. I'm done taking orders from you people. Wait, Amadou, it's not like that, she says, getting up and walking over to me, but I shake off her outstretched hands. In my head, I can hear Moki's voice grumbling about what a rude person his grandson has turned into, but I push that thought away. Why should I care what the wildcat does? Just because we've been looking out for each other for a while doesn't mean that we owe each other anything. It's not like she's really my sister. But what about Seydou? She asks in a whisper. I whirl on her. What about him? I shout. My chest is heaving as I talk, and I feel like I can't get enough air. I can take care of Seydou. I did it for years before you showed up, so don't pretend that you're the one who knows what's best for him. 
I'll take the medicine with me and he'll be fine. We don't need you in your fancy city reading for me to give him the right pills. I don't need you to make him better. I stop talking and fist my hands against my face because my voice is breaking and I'm never going to win an argument if I'm weak. I have to be strong. I pull shuddering breaths in and out, trying to count them and failing, trying to loosen the metal bands that have been wrapped around my rib cage and are tightening, tightening as I consider leaving Khadijah to fend for herself and taking Sadu safely through the bush to Molly alone. Sadu who can barely walk. Sadu who's still spending way too much time sleeping. Sadu who, in spite of the pills from the dark bottle with the chip at the bottom, is still too warm to the touch and has a swollen stump where an arm should be. I feel Khadijah's hand. Don't touch me, I shout. But Khadijah doesn't listen. Instead, she wraps her arms around me. The medicine box is a hard lump between us, but she leans her head against my shoulder and says, It's okay, Amadou. Sadu's gonna be all right. And I stand there stiffly, not reaching around her, but not stepping away, and I let the tears fall from my chin onto the top of her head where they collect in the ridges of her frayed braids and sparkle up at me in the low light.